thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be invited to be here today. I wanted to ask a question first. Who, is there anyone here, I, think, I know there are a couple, who knew my mother or, uh, I know Pete did, Julie did, back up there. Um, I have, we have in the audience Joanna Kafarowski who's doing a biography, a really definitive, very detailed biography on my mother. So I think she'd be interested in talking with anyone who's willing to about your experiences with my mother. So we will start. Um, I know we're celebrating the 50 year anniversary of the team of women that went down there, but uh, as you know, women did precede that uh, expedition and uh, created history before that. All right, this is not going. I no, will do this one. Neither one. There we go. Push that heart, okay. So before even my mother, um, the, the title Antarctica's First Lady is one I kind of came up with my, with my mother for her book. book. Um, <laughs> um, but she truly was not really the first woman to go there. The first woman to go there was Ingrid Christensen with her friend um, Matilda Wegner. She was a Norwegian and her husband owned a shipping line of whaling ships and she went with her husband in 1931. So she, they, all they did was go around the continent. But she did not actually, she sighted land, but not, did not go ashore. And here she is with her, um, she's the, the woman on the left with the fur parka, and her friend is on the right there. And her husband is actually on the, on the left. And she returned uh, two more times in 33 and 34 with a couple other women who actually don't show up in history books much unless you really get into it. <laughs> And then the first woman who's credited with stepping ashore is Caroline Mickelson, also a Norwegian, whose husband was captain of the same ship, but in 1935, down in those waters. And she set foot on an island. And she was on, sh on the island for about 15 minutes, enough to raise the Norwegian flag. And um, that was pretty much it. But she is credited with being the first woman to set foot on land in the Antarctic, but not but it was an island. <laughs> um, and then again, Ingrid Christensen came back in 1937, and she flew over, this, over the uh, continent. She dropped a Norwegian flag over the lands because they were trying to claim it for Norway, and she went ashore, as we can see in the lower right, with her husband, Lars Christensen. And then, 10 years later, my mother accompanied my father and became the first American woman to set foot on the continent, followed two weeks later by Canadian Jenny Darlington, who was also in my father's expedition. And I'll be talking primarily about that today. In 1964, my family, we were in Norway. We've been there many times. And um, we were invited to dinner at Lars Christensen's home with Ingrid Christensen. And I happened to snap this picture of my parents with the Christiansons. So this is kind of a historic picture of the two women who um, kind of are credited with uh, uh, Antarctic history. And then I add in, which has been talked about today, the, the first women at South Pole. You already know about the six uh, women with the journals along. And in 1971, my mother was the next woman to be at the South Pole. So, She's credited with being the first American woman to set foot on the continent and the first woman ever to winter over as a working member of an Antarctic expedition. I haven't told this story really to anyone, but uh, when I was uh, very young, and living in Baltimore. There was a lamppost there that, that was very close to my house and I used to put my hand on the lamppost and swing around, just go around and around and around and around. And while I was doing that, I re remember that I was thinking about my future life and I would think, I'm not going to lead a normal nine to five type of s sedentary life, something going to happen that's different with me. I'm going to, to uh, uh, lead a much more exciting life than that. 
and indeed she did. Um, her parents were very low income uh, people from Baltimore. Um, her father was not a very ambitious man and he had small jobs and oftentimes was not employed and her mother was a housewife. But they met and married and had my mother in 1990, 1919. Actually this past Sunday would have been her 100th birthday. And here are a couple pictures of her with her parents. And she lived in uh, several houses. They kind of moved around. And, um, but the primary house is in the center. And then when she was a bit older, uh, the house below. I have these for Joanna, too, so she could see these. <laughs> um, and here are some pictures of her in her childhood growing up. But she was definitely a Balmer, Balmer girl. And she graduated at the age of 16. She was advanced several times to school at, at age 16 from Eastern High School. Um, she's, her nickname was always Jackie, and I'll tell you real quickly how she got that. She had a Girl Scout camp one summer when she was 14. Um, the girls wanted to fool the counselors, so they all got, got together and changed their names and gave <laughs> other nicknames. And they were based on their father's first name. Well, her father's first name was Charles, and there was another Charlie. So they went to my mother's father's middle name, which is Jackson. And so they said, she's going to be Jackie. And... That was forgotten after Girl Scout camp until she showed up on George Washington University campus as a junior, and the first person she ran into was from Girl Scout camp and knew her as Jackie. So started calling her Jackie, and that name kind of stuck and grew and grew, and more and more people called her Jackie. No relation to Edith. <laughs> um, because of a because of a difficult. Um, childhood with her parents, she actually went to live with her paternal grandparents in Baltimore, and they raised her from the, from 16, from 15, I'm sorry, from 14 to 18 years of age, after which time she went to Chevy Chase, Maryland, to live with her uh, aunt, Mariel, and the, that's the house in the center there, um, and here are pictures of her with, with her aunt and uncle, and they were the ones who really did a lot for her. Um, her aunt put her through college. She went to the college, Worcester College of Ohio for two years. And that was the answer in the crossword puzzle, if anybody did it. <laughs> college of Worcester, that was the answer. Um, and, but she majored in boys. So my aunt, <laughs> so her aunt brought her home to DC to live in Chevy Chase and she finished going to George Washington University in DC. And she majored in history. She graduated at the age of 20, and uh, she later made history of her own. She started working first for the National Geographic Society. She was a typist, not a very good one apparently, but. <laughs> <laughs> and then she later moved over to the US State Department and the Foreign Affairs Office. But here's some pictures of her kind of in those early years around Washington. A woman who later became my godmother, introduced my father and mother. Um, they were 20 years apart, but they had in common that they skied. Now my father, as I'll explain a little bit later, was an expert skier. He ski jumped all over Norway and, and the cross country skied all over the Antarctic. My mother's skiing consisted of going down a tiny little hill be, in Rock Creek Park between, behind the Shoreham Hotel. But <laughs> they did find things in common and married a year later in 1944. And their honeymoon was, guess what, skiing at Stowe, Vermont. <laughs> and in their early married life, my father had been to the Antarctic uh, two times before. Actually, great. Um, and um, he promised my mother that he would not go to the Antarctic again, that he was home to stay. But in the back of his mind, he was sort of plotting another expedition to the Antarctic. So my mother married into a family, the Ronnie family of Antarctic explorers, and I'll tell you a little bit about them first. My grandfather, Martin Renne, so the way they pronounce it in Norway, he was a sail maker. He made sails and tents and, and um, trail bags and all kinds of things like that on, on the um, Amundsen. Well, I'll get to that. All right. So he was on, um, he was on Roald Amundsen's 
expedition when he was originally going to the North Pole, but changed to go to the South Pole when he learned Perry had made claim to the North Pole. And um, all the men stayed on board and agreed to go. And my, my grandfather fulfilled the role of, again, of making the sails for the prom and um, tents and things like that. And so there's a picture of him and the uh, group of men. And he, there's a picture of him there on the, in the field. And he did make the tent, famous picture, I'm sure you've all seen these pictures, um, that Amundsen left at the South Pole. That tent was made by my grandfather. And of course, you all know that Scott arrived five weeks later to find the tent, realizing he had lost that race. And there's a duplicate of the tent in the Fromm Museum in Oslo. And he retired in Norway, never to go again. But uh, Bird was planning an expedition to the Antarctic, and he asked Amundsen if he had recommendations for any crew people. The only person he recommended was my grandfather, who turned him down twice before the third telegram came came over and offered him so much money, he never heard of so much money. So, <laughs> so he came out of retirement at the age of 67, and he was the only member of the bird expedition who had been there before. And here he is again with his sewing machine and fixing the tents and trail gear. My father was born uh, 10 days into the 19th century, and he was born and raised in Horten, Norway. His father, Martin, he was on many, many ships, but he would come home just long enough to have another child. There were, seven, <laughs> there were seven children, and my grandmother had to raise them pretty much by herself during that period of time. And so here are a few pictures of him growing up, and you can see all the children in the center. Um, but he got a degree in naval architecture, and he was a ski jumping champion uh, in Norway. He came to the United States at the age of 23 and a citizen five years later, and he worked for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh. And he joined, oh yeah, he did later on join the Navy Reserves in 41 from the Antarctic on the U.S. Antarctic Service Expedition. And I love this quote that Carl Eklund, who was a fellow explorer on the U.S. Antarctic Service Expedition made, by inheritance, inclination, and training, Finn is well suited for the explorer's trade. When he, uh, from, from the Antarctic, Bird cabled my father, and he said, if you are half as much a man as your daddy, I will be delighted to take you on my next expedition. <laughs> and so he did. So my father was on the second bird expedition, and he was the ski expert and dog trainer for that. And here's some publicity photos that were taken of him uh, with the dogs. This is a, a side story, but it's kind of a cute story. So when they return, when Bird returned to Little America, and he was showing my father around specifically, and he wanted to show my father the bunk that his father had had, and they went to see the bunk, and on the wall was written Finn Ronnie. Martin, his father, had written his name on the bunk out of seven children. He wrote Finn Ronnie. And Bird said he didn't see that before he had left from the first expedition. He must have done it at the last minute. So of course my father had to have the same bunk. And it was not so great because it was right next to one of the doors going outside and it was always very cold. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then my father made actually plans for his own private expedition. But in planning it and trying to get help for it, the um, actually the National Park Service at the time, uh, took it, took the expedition over, and then Bird was made titular head of it, and it was the U.S. Antarctic Service Expedition, and my father was second in command at East Base in the Peninsula area, and he was also in charge of uh, constructing the buildings that were, were that were going to be their base there. So he, you can see pictures of him overseeing that. The World War II drew to a close. Finn once again began making plans for his own expedition. After great dedication and unbelievable persistence, he became only the third and last American ever to launch a private scientific expedition to the Antarctic. And so was born the Rani Antarctic Research Expedition, only one of three private expeditions done by Americans. The other two were led by very wealthy uh, gentlemen, 
And my father was an immigrant from Norway. He didn't have any college or fraternity associations, but he managed to beg, borrow, and steal enough equipment and money to pull the expedition off. As you can see on the left, there was still a lot of the Antarctic to be mapped in the peninsula area, and his goal was to fill in the maps. They've got a government borrowed ship. It was loaded in Beaumont, Texas, because that's where it was. Um, my mother went, flew down for two weeks from the State Department to help christen the ship, and here I'll let her talk. I started for a year's stay on the Antarctic continent with one small suitcase, which contained a good suit, a good dress, nylon stockings, and high heel shoes. <laughs> So actually it was a, f a fateful event when they were loading the ship in Beaumont that sort of uh, snowballed into my mother eventually going. Their main um, plane that was going to do the mapping crashed on the dock because some lines, the, the crane lines broke. And it was a total wreck and it, it was really kind of the whole, the heart of the expedition. So um, my father had to fly back to, the, to Washington to get Congress to authorize another plane because it had been borrowed from, from the uh, Air Force. And um, so, but he went through, he, my father was always very calm when something happened. And um, so he, they finished loading the ship and the crowds watched them depart Beaumont. And right away, my father asked my mother to stay on board the ship to keep an eye on things while he went back to Washington. And he was gonna rejoin the ship with a plane in Panama. So they had their departure, my father in his Navy uniform. They sailed down the Neches River out into the um, Gulf of Mexico, and he got off the ship downriver and flew back to Washington. So my mother stayed on board because um, she had helped my father plan the expedition. His native no language was Norwegian, and so she did a lot of the editing of all his letters and um, everything he was working on. So she was intimately involved in the planning. And so she could kind of keep an eye on things. She knew what to keep an eye on and while he was gone. And at the, that was the beginning of him saying, my father telling, saying to my mother, why don't you come along? You'll be more helpful to me there. And she's like, no way, not a chance. Um, and so it was being discussed on the way down to um, Valparaiso, Chile. And you know, they talked to the other expedition members, many many of whom were opposed because this was not, not considered. Um, and she was writing letters back to her Aunt Mariel and Chevy Chase, and who was horrified and <laughs> kept sending all these letters to her that, the, that she picked up on, on in the embassies along the way. And, um, in the, well, I guess I have it on another slide. But in the last letter that she received, my aunt was desperate, and she said, and don't forget, you're going to ruin your complexion. <laughs> <laughs> and so my mother decided Finn needs me and I'm going to go with him. And that's just in her diary. So they convinced, she convinced Jenny Darlington, a Canadian a woman who was married to the chief, had just married the chief pilot. She wrote that book, Antarctic Honeymoon, um, uh, to go along. And that was the only way my mother would agree to go. And so her husband, Harry, was not enthusiastic at all. But she did agree to go. She went without any specific job title. Uh, but my mother was officially made the official recorder and newspaper correspondent. On the, so they headed south, and that was, yeah, there's it about my Aunt Mariel. And don't forget, you might ruin your complexion. Um, so my mother was like, here she is approaching the ice pack, and she's going, what the hell did I get myself into? <laughs> So, but when she went, my father executed some documents that provided my mother would take over the leadership of the expedition if something happened to him on an ill-fated flight or anything else. Of course, the men didn't know that. They would have not been happy with that, but unfortunately that didn't come to pass. But she knew the commitments that the uh, expedition had to various um, companies who were supporting it, and so she was a logical one to take over if, if need be. And here's a picture actually that she took first coming into Stonington Island. The base is located in the Peninsula area in Marguerite Bay. 
there are different views of it there. And these are pictures from the flyover where the star is. I do have a pointer here. Where the star is, that's where the base is. The, the site was chosen, it's an island, but it was chosen in the US Antarctic Service Expedition in 39 because it had a connection to the mainland, which um, enabled the dog sleds to go directly over into the mainland area. And it was this was also used as a runway for the planes to take off. Today, it's all gone. It's an independent island. So they were unloading, um, moving the supplies from the ship around to the uh, base and reoccupying those buildings from the US Antarctic Service Expedition. I have to tell you a little bit about the expedition in order to put my mother's being there in context. So um, they purposely froze the Port of Beaumont ship into the ice. It's the first time a ship was purposely frozen into the ice uh, for the entire winter. And they, waited, they unloaded everything, but they waited until the ice around it froze solid so that they could unload the heavy airplanes. And in her diary, she says, I am, I believe, the first woman to set foot on the Antarctic continent. Of course, we learned later that she was not, but um, she can claim the first American woman. <laughs> um, here she is helping, my, helping the couple of guys raise the U.S. flag on um, the reclaimed U.S. base. When I stepped ashore with them, it was brought to my attention that I was the first American woman to set foot on the continent. Then and I lived in a 12-foot square hut. I wrote newspaper releases for the North American Newspaper Alliance and the New York Times. Back then, plotted plane flights and dog team routes for sledge parties to follow in the field when the sun... I'm going to have to move along because I'm running out of time. Anyway, here's pictures, old pictures on the left, new picture that I took in 95 on the right. You can see the snow is not as deep as it was. And here is the Ronnie hut where they stayed and the 12 by 12 hut for um, the time they were there for 15 months. Um, on the left again as it was in the old days and how it looks more recently. And there, <laughs> there was a connection, there was a canvas passageway that connected the bunkhouse to the Ronnie hut. And I have a clip of my mother saying this, but um, it's not a good clip. So, but basically she talks about how everybody would struggle with the toilet paper in the outhouse and the winds would come up and it would keep flying up and she'd have to grab it and, and uh, that sort of thing. And no, but nobody talked about it. And finally, uh, somebody did and everybody burst out laughing because they were all having the same experience. <laughs> And so during the winter night, um, the men, well, they lived kind of, you know, normal stuff. I'm sure those of you who have been there uh, overwintering know, you know, you have an in indoor routine. And um, they watched a lot of movies um, and got, and they pr did a lot of preparations. Well, they had social events too. And uh, they celebrated winter night and Christmas and things like that. And that was the only time my father allowed them to have alcohol, but they kind of made their own alcohol anyway. <laughs> um, and the winter night, they did a lot of preparations for um, the coming summer months when they would be out in the field flying and doing dog sledding. Um, here my mother is helping the cook, Sig Gutenko, uh, prepare pemmican, which are the, the meat cakes that they would give the dogs on the trail. And in the Ronnie hut, my mother did usual things of relaxing, cooking, knitting, and her knitting is actually in the Navy Museum on display. And, but her main job was to write the articles for the North American Newspaper Alliance, which is kind of the New York Times, as it were, about the um, expedition's progress and discoveries, and they sent in reports several times a week by teletype. And here my father was going over his flight plans for the spring uh, mapping season uh, to make sure my mother had some awareness of where they were going and what the plans were so that if anything were to have happened, she would have had some idea of what was going on. And so in the spring, they got out to ex explore and ski a bit. And this picture on the left actually is a famous picture. It was all over the world in publications. Um, and she also cared for the husky dogs and the puppies that were born. And she loved those too. I have to go fast. But she also worked with scientists and she made field and flight trips into the unknown uh, for, for mapping. And my father, even though there was another woman along, my, you can be sure my father made sure my mother did everything first. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, and as I said, the primary goal was to map the unknown um, areas of the peninsula that were not known. And um, anyway, here's some, um, I have to go through this quick. Uh, there's my father getting into the main uh, plane that was going to take the photographs. And they had three planes, the Norsemen, Stinson, for people into planes. Um, Norsemen, Stinson L5, this is a port plane bringing the fuel, at, to along with the, the Beechcraft, which was the main um, main film for the filming. And what they did was they had um, a camera on the left horizon, a camera on the right horizon, and these are the cameras, they were big, um, and one facing straight down. And they would fly along mountains and valleys and whatnot and take overlapping pictures. And um, then they also had to make stops in the field in order to do sightings of the mountaintop so they could coordinate the sight sightings in the field with the mountaintops, and that's how they mapped it. And uh, here again is the pit planes landed in the field and a couple shots of the scenery. And they, just, and they ended up discovering the last unknown coastline on the globe. And that area behind it, uh, my father named after my mother, Edith Ronnie Land, but it was discovered it was a much larger ice shelf than they realized. And in later years it was named Edith Ronnie Ice Shelf and then Ronnie Ice Shelf. And they also had some dog sledding treks with other men in the, in the group went out to do scientific and geological, geographical, geological discoveries in the field. And uh, some of you may know Bob Dodson. He was a geologist on the expedition. And um, he was, he's in one of these pictures here. <laughs> yeah, there he is. That's Bob Dodson there. And the achievements of the expedition uh, were far greater than my father envisioned, and they did many, many reports on various sciences uh, listed there. I won't read them, but you can see uh, the, the, the vast variety of things that they were looking at while they were there. And um, the flying program with the three planes uh, covered 39,000 air miles, took 14,000 pictures, covering 450,000 square miles, and discovered, as I said, the last coastline. And they determined that the Weddell Sea and the Ross, Ross Seas were not connected and that the Antarctic in that area was one continent. So on their departure, they were actually uh, uh, iced in. And so there were two icebreakers in the area coming down for uh, Operation Deep Freeze, I guess it was. And um, so they actually came and made a channel out so they could get out. But this is my mother and father getting on one of the icebreakers to discuss getting out. And this picture really represents the last, the transition from private expeditions like my father's to government programs. Because at that moment, they were the icebreakers were down in, there to start the government um, discoveries in the Antarctic from then on. It's been government. So um, that's kind of a strange picture, but there it is. So um, the ship was ready to sail, and uh, they were they were able to get out. Everybody was looking around like, can we stay here another year? <laughs> um, there's my father and mother coming on their way back on the Explorers Club flag. And when they got into New York, um, they were greeted with an honorary spray from the Harbor Master, and there were crowds on the dock to greet them. And um, so they were honored by by people coming aboard. Um, one was Sir Hubert Wilkins, who, those of you who know Antarctic history, he was the first flyer in the Antarctic, and he was dying to come on and see my father's flying charts because he wanted to see what what more he had found by by air. So um, that was very exciting. Here's the last picture of the expedition, minus the Darlingtons who got off in South America, and. The names, if you know anybody there. This woman, and she uh, really worked hard at supporting her husband. And she was interested in the science that was being done, and she still is. They proved their main objective was this uh, 500 mile stretch of uh, unknown coastline. It was the last unknown coastline. Well, I'm going to just go on. Um, I thought you all enjoy seeing my mother talk because you get a sense of who she is. I was born in 1951, no secret. Um, and I grew up, <laughs> I grew up uh, in, with this, it was always part of my life growing up. 
even my birth announcement was Antarctic Explorer born. Um, and of course I was in the ref requisite parkas and fur parkas. And so they returned to much publicity and my mother did um, uh, a lot of publicity things, though they didn't really seek publicity. I'm gonna skip the turn I just don't have time. Um, so they came back to a lot of fame and publicity and met a lot of interesting people. They were featured on magazine covers and whatnot and um, did a lot of lecturing all over the world, actually. My father and my, my mother backed him up with lectures as well. And um, then she spent many years writing the uh, Britannica articles for the annual updates. And um, she authored all those for many years. And she, in, in her speaking and everything, she, kinda, she was kind of called an ambassador for the Antarctic back in the days. Um, she had a lot of honors with the King of Norway and Society of Women Geographers. She met a lot of interesting people. Neil Armstrong was signing the uh, Explorers Globe, American Geographical Society's Explorers Globe. She and my father returned. Uh, they went to the South Pole in 1971. Um, and here they are there. Um, my father authored five, uh, four books. And though his name is on it, she really wrote a lot of it and um, edited it thoroughly edited his books. And my father died in 1980 at the age of 80 and is buried in Arlington. And she outlived him for 29 years. She was a guest lecturer on um, nine tourist cruises on the Explorer and the Marco Polo. And I got to go with her uh, six, six times. Um, and we did return to Stonington Island um, in the Antarctic uh, where she was. And um, so she showed me around. We got actually we were, we were taking a shore before everybody else, so we she could show me around. And uh, I can't. I don't have time for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, and I'm putting this out there. If anybody wants to dispute it, I'd like to know. But I'm putting it out there that I believe that our family is the first of four generations in a family to have visited the Antarctic because I was there with my kids. So I'm saying my grandfather, father, mother, me, and my kids. So if anybody knows of any family that has that record, I'd like to know about it. But I'm putting this out there. <laughs> and my mother published her autobiography in 19, uh, 2004. I do have some copy. I'm not hawking it, but if anybody, <laughs> but if anybody really wants some, I have some copies available for sale. And I think we're near the end. Oh, yeah, she died in 2009 and is, of course, buried with my mother in Arlington Cemetery, just a couple rows away from Admiral Byrd and um, his pilot, um, Balkan. Yes, Bert Balkan. And um, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, it took some time.